events sort of got kicked off when my dad was talking about his recent trip to Cuba, a trip he took with me and, and my wife Margaret, um, to visit our son Zach, who was studying at the University of Havana. So we all ended up with these little cross currents. And of course, Pop has had an, an interest and a knowledge of, of Cuba back from quite a while in the past when he was teaching um, Caribbean history. And, and, uh, and you said you finally ponied up some notes on Cuban history, right? Um, so that was sort of his long-term interest. I was working at, uh, at Burlington College in Burlington that has um, an exchange, not an exchange, but a foreign study program, as well as short course programs um, in, uh, in Cuba. And uh, Zach found, uh, found his own way, so the three of them, which I'll let him talk about in, uh, in a minute or two. So all three of us found our, our ways into or around Cuba, which you know, those of you who know Cuba know is an incredibly fascinating place. I, I keep saying the more I learn about it, the less I feel I know. Um, and uh, so what, um, what we're going to do this evening is share just a little bit of, of sort of substantive background to make sure that we're all kind of playing, uh, starting from the, same, from the same page, and then sort of go through an, an, an almost random selection of images that, that we brought back and, at that, and tell some stories along the way, and then open it up for questions. And we've got a whole bunch of pictures that will run while we're doing uh, questions, and if any of them strike people's fancies, we'll try to find them again and, and, uh, and talk about them and, and kick off uh, from there. So that's, that's the general lay of the land, and I'll let uh, Zach talk a little bit about what got him to Cuba. Um, so like my dad said, I was studying abroad at the University of Havana for a semester. I went down at the beginning, or about the middle of January, and came back uh, just a couple weeks ago. And I was taking classes at the university, living in Havana, um, uh, both to practice Spanish and also because I'm a political science major. So getting an opportunity to see a socialist country and some of the realities of how other political systems really work on the ground uh, was a, a fas fascinating opportunity for me. And so like my dad said, Burlington College has a semester program, which is how I uh, ended up there. And so they arranged much of the travel that I found myself down living in what was essentially a, a hostel for other Cubans um, down in Cuba for four months taking classes at the University of Havana with other Cubans, Cuban professors, um, and it was a really great opportunity to kind of immerse myself in the culture and uh, the society to find out what it was really like um, down there, which I thought was an incredible experience. Okay. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about well, what, yeah. what you bring to Cuba? Well, what I um, used to be, a, I was formerly a, a professor of history, and I had a course called Caribbean America, and in it, uh, the island of Cuba, I had, I always lectured on Cuba, and I remained fascinated. But I am more interested in hearing what Zach has to say about Cuba well, than, and, and than the rest of you. So uh, I'm going to give a story uh, somewhat, and I'll just chime in now and then. How's that? All right. So let, let's start with the really, really basic stuff, um, because uh, things that I didn't know, for instance, about Cuba, which is how big it was which turns out to be, uh, given my manipulation of, of, uh, of uh, Google Earth, about 700 miles east-west and about 75 miles north-south, depending exactly on how you measure it, um, and uh, making it the biggest island in the Caribbean by far. Mm -hmm. uh, you see uh, Hispaniola just to the lower right. Zach, you've got the little gizmo. You can like, go crazy with the pointer here. Um, and which is the second largest island and is considerably smaller. Uh, it is, in fact, the 17th largest island in the world, smaller than Newfoundland and larger than Iceland. But um, you know, people say, and you can see why, because if you point to where the Florida Keys come down from Miami, they say on a good day from Havana, you can pretty much see the glow from, uh, from Key West. Um, if you laid it out on top of the United States, just to give it some scale, you'd have Washington in the lower right there stretching pretty much all the way to Chicago. So that day, for those of you who have driven that stretch of road, that may give you a sense of, uh, of what we're talking about in terms of of size. Though the drive would take significantly longer in Cuba given the roads. <laughs> <laughs> um, basic demographic info. Um, Zach, you want, do you want to talk about this? Can you put this together? It's a, yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Um, so, the, so the population of the country is about 11 million, uh, with 2.5 million people living. Here, please. Hold it close. Hold it close. Um, yeah. So the population of the country is about 11 million with 2.5 million people living in the city of Havana, by far the largest center of population. The racial 
makeup of the country is, I mean, here you can say, you can see we've got about a third white mixed and black, but it's actually quite an interesting academic question as to how you measure it because um, when people self-report, they vastly over self-report as white, um, but when you try and come up with some more objective measures, it gets much uh, more complicated. So the, the racial makeup of Cuba, as historically uh, makes it so interesting, is very complicated as a mix of Spanish settlement. And what is it? What is it? What's the answer? There is no I mean, No one knows. No one knows exactly. Um, but like I said, it, it appears to be about one third, one third. And so, yeah, religion, we can talk about more about this later if people are interested, but obviously it is a majority Catholic country with a lot of adherence to different sects and versions of Santeria, the mix of the African religions and Catholicism, although the country officially has no, is, is secular, um, which changed in, I want to say the late 90s, they officially dropped atheist from the description of the Cuban government. <coughs> Those of, those of you who followed the uh, recent thaw in relations between the United States and, and Cuba will know that um, the Pope uh, was an instrumental part of sort of creating that, that atmosphere and, and brokered some of the initial meetings. Raul Castro recently met, uh, was in um, Rome and met the Pope for it's about three, four weeks ago and uh, said that if uh, he meant all these things that he was saying about the poor and social action, why he would actually start going to mass. I think there were people who were surprised by that. Um, but actually the substantive thing that came out of that is apparently to date it has been very difficult to be a member of the Catholic Church or, or a, an out and out adherent of Catholicism and a member of the Communist Party and he explicitly said that they would be changing that. So uh, there may be actually some substance to the rhetoric. Um, I. I one of the things that struck me most deeply when, when I went to Cuba was sort of looking around at the social conditions that I found there. And, and there is a real sense, I had a real sense from walking around the streets, from talking to people, that the extremes of wealth and poverty that you know, we see in the United States, certainly that I'm used to seeing all over the rest of Latin America, they don't hit you in the face. They certainly didn't hit me in the face uh, when I was in Cuba. It's much harder to get a bunch of statistics to actually back that up for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, Cuba is, of course, um, is a, um, not affiliated with the IMF. I don't believe it is a member of the World Bank. So all of our most common statistical gathering um, enterprises don't, their lists often do not include Cuba. So I did manage to, to get some statistics, which you see here. GDP at about $6,500 a person puts it the same, in the same league as, as South Africa. Um, literacy that we'll talk about a little bit later is um, the uh, CIA World Factbook reports at 99 plus actually um, percent, which puts it you know, up in, in the top rank. Life expectancy, for a country with its income level at 79 years is about the same as the United States, which put, puts it above the curve if you uh, actually plot those things against each other. And similarly, infant mortality um, at 4.7 per thousand births um, puts it you know, far below the United States and again puts it in um, the upper third or, or quarter of countries in the world. Those were the statistics that I found that really backed up sort of the, the rhetorical piece that one often hears about Cuba, which is that there is free health care, there is free education, um, unemployment is either non-existent or very low, depending on you know, what kind of measure you use. Um, there, you know, whereas we talk a lot about whether or not our social safety net is fraying in the United States, there is a real sense in Cuba, and including I think a sense of solidarity on, on, on the part of the Cubans that they have achieved a great deal in terms of social equality since 1959, since the revolution, and that you know that tide has lifted has lifted all boats. Um, but did you? No, I agree with you. I look for. Uh, I didn't see the poverty that exists in many of the. 
Caribbean countries that we went to, uh, Cuba is far ahead in that sense. And uh, of course, uh, in, in regard to uh, begging, I saw no begging in the street. Though you can't tell with the, the Castros, people would have said any kids found begging will be shot. I mean, I, I don't know. There just was no begging, and uh, the uh, the health care and the education also seemed to be much more developed than I had seen in any Latin American country. Um, yeah, that all being said, certainly there are no people begging the streets. You don't see people sleeping in the parks. Pretty much everyone has health care. Pretty much everyone can go to, can get to receive basic schooling if they want it. Um, that said, there are people who are obviously much better off than others. And you can see that in who has cars to drive, who has um, you know, the newest fancy watches and stuff like that walking down the street. So, but there certainly is much less disparity between those two groups in Cuba than in the United States or in many other Latin American countries. Yes, I think, I think we, we have to be especially careful so we did want to do a little bit of, of Cuban history, perhaps not not a ton. And um, Zach, I think you were going to talk to yeah, some of these points just to yeah. waltz us through. Yeah. Um, and this is, like you said, a very, very brief history of Cuba, focusing on kind of interesting facts that I had did not know about before I went down to Cuba, and that kind of surprised me as an American. Um, so first, obviously, um, there were indigenous people there before the Europeans arrived, um, three major tribes. There isn't a lot known about them because after the Spanish arrived, um, Columbus on his first voyage arrived there on October 28th in 1942, in 1492, excuse me. Um, and very soon after, pretty much the entire indigenous population was wiped out through both disease and then later uh, enslavement and, and maltreatment by the Spanish. Um, sorry. Uh, so it was a Spanish colony for a long time. And what made Havana such an interesting city is that it was the meeting point for the uh, many of the Spanish uh, galleons going back to Spain, crossing from the New World back to Spain. So they had a lot of sailors who would arrive there in their ship and realize we have to wait three months here until the rest of the flotilla gathers so that we can all head back to Spain together, which made it a major um, commercial port and really helped its, its development in those early years, which I didn't know about. Also, the British took over Havana and occupied half of the country um, for a number of years after the Seven Years' War, which was just another historical tidbit, which I had never heard about. Um, but then the real kind of modern Cuban identity begins in the late 1800s uh, with their, the beginning of their struggle for independence against Spain. Uh, so there were three wars of independence. Uh, the first, which they called the Ten Years' War, was 1868 to 1878. And it was started when this man, Carlos Manuel de Cespedes, um, he was a wealthy landowner. He freed his slaves, which was a major issue in, um, in such a heavily like Afro-Caribbean uh, country. He freed his slaves and said, you know, come join the army, we'll fight for, for freedom against Spain. And that kind of kicked off the first war and also made slavery a huge aspect of the Cuban fight for independence. So that was, a, like I said, a year a war that lasted 10 years. It failed. Um, and then they finally signed a peace treaty in 78. There was a very short war um, that came after that uh, for one year, and then there was a long period of peace uh, until this man, Jose Marti, whose picture is here, he's sort of the, maybe the most well-known Cuban uh, in all of Cuban history. They call him the apostle of, of Cuban independence. Um, and so he was Thomas actually- Jefferson. <laughs> yeah, he was a writer, a, a, a philosopher, a journalist. He was kicked out of Cuba for revolutionary <laughs> activity when he was very young. Actually, when he was still technically a minor, he was imprisoned, and his parents petitioned the government to release him from prison because he was so young. And they said, okay, instead of prison, he has to go to Spain. So they sent him to Spain, where he continued to be a rabble rouser and a revolutionary. He finally traveled around uh, Central and South America, lived in the United States for a number of years. He was a newspaper reporter for the world. Uh, he, he had the best description of the blizzard of 88 you can read in any paper in the world. Um, and so then he founded the Cuban Revolutionary Party, which kind of brought together all the Cuban expatriates at the time. They put together lots of funds and prepared the final and finally uh, successful war in uh, 1895. And he was killed very soon after, again, at the age of 42, I think. He was very young in one of the first battles of the revolution. And so kind of his early death and his extreme work and ardor for, for Cuban independence 
make him a very, very subtle figure in, in well, modern. I mean, music and everything. Yeah, I mean, he wrote all of them. Yeah, everything he wrote is super famous, and they all read it in school. They can all recite his poetry by heart. Um, it's it's really incredible. Pratton, what? Pratton, poet. Oh, you're right. That doesn't go through that. Okay, sorry. So, uh, so that the final war against the Spanish ended with the U.S. involvement. The final treaty that ended that war was a treaty signed between the United States and Spain. Cuba did not have a voice in ending that war, which is uh, something that they're still very contentious about. So what followed was essentially um, 40 or 50 years of- United States occupation. Yeah, both du jour and de facto. They, the Americans, we forced Cuba to include an amendment in their constitution that said, if the United States doesn't like something you're doing, we are legally allowed to send in the troops. Um, and we did that a number of times. Uh, that was called the Platt Amendment and continues to be a sore point in, 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 it was a terrible thing to do. That said, we also had a number of naval bases. Now we just know about Guantanamo, but at the time I believe we had four around the country to uh, supply our steamships with coal. Um, and it was essentially, a, we, Cuba was a, a colony of the United States economically. Americans owned a vast majority of the land, many of the major businesses, the utilities, the electric company, phone companies, everything like that. The trams, the streetcars. Yeah, uh, almost absolutely everything. And so as time went on, the Cubans were less and less okay with that situation until we finally get to Batista. Yeah. We're going to take over. Well, uh, Fulgencio Batista um, led a revolution. When did he come to power? About in the mid-30s. Mid-30s. He was very popular at first. He was a man of the people. He came in as a mulatto sergeant. <coughs> And he went out as a white general. I mean, that's the transition <laughs> that, that happens in Cuba. You, you can't help it. Uh, uh, there is racism in Cuba. Uh, I don't. I don't know whether today, but I. I at least from my historical stuff, there is. And um, he was very popular. Batista was very popular in the United States. But as he as time went on, he he said, "Okay, let's have a democracy," and. A man was elected, and he didn't like him, and then he threw him out and took over as a complete dictator somewhere in the 40s and early 40s. And from there on out, you know, from there on out, it was downhill all the way. The United States gave absolute support for Batista, but it wasn't enough to stop Castro. I mean, yeah. So, I mean, if technology no, it's not going to favor us soon. Well, maybe it will. Um, so one of the things that Batista did was... Um, one moment, technical difficulties. Let's try that again. Hopefully we'll be all happy. Yeah. Um, well, he, when he got in bed with the Mafia, they, this is a great place for the Mafia to launder um, their money. So this is the Hotel Riviera. It was built by Meyer Lansky. Um, it was a great way to, uh, you know, to, to launder some of his funds and um, did not shy away from its connection to the Mafia because this one takes a while to load because it's big, um, but uh, you could swim in the swimming pool and, assuming this comes up, uh, maybe not. There we go. Anybody get the shape of the swimming pool there? That was apparently not an accident. It is coffin shaped. Uh, uh, the hotel is still there. It's uh, open. It's recently been renovated. I don't know, actually. We didn't go in. I don't know whether it's actually a place you, you know, one would want to stay. It's right on the, uh, on the uh, waterfront. It's a, it's a lovely location. So, you know, there was lots of money um, slash, sloshing back and forth. Um, and, uh, and that's one of the things that made, uh, that made Batista very unpopular in his, in his second um, reign. Um, Pop, you, you said you were working with the Inter-American Association yeah. for Democracy and Freedom, and you guys yeah. were trying to give them a hard time? Yes, we did give them a hard time. I was with an, organ, an NGO called the Inter-American Association for Freedom and Democracy, and they fought Batista all the way down the line, and, and we were persona non grata with them and, until the end. And when Castro came in in 59, we certainly cheered, as did everyone. So. Definitely not going to do the whole history of the Cuban Revolution, but um, you basically from 1953 through January of 1959, 
you know, Castro is sort of the motivating figure behind initially a series of attacks and then some very strong rhetoric and, and becomes a very charismatic figure, um, invades with this, uh, this boat from, uh, from the Yucatan, from, from Mexico, uh, lands in Cuba in what Che Guevara described as really it wasn't a landing, it was a shipwreck. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, which actually does form a little theme that we'll get back to um, at least uh, in a moment in, in attempting to in, invade uh, invade Cuba, and um, you know United States relations with Cuba went from sort of guardedly optimistic that maybe this was going to work out and, and quickly descended to the very pessimistic and the institutional um, conflict between the two um, by um, 1960 when freighters are exploding under suspicious circumstances in, uh, in Havana Harbor, and finally when the U.S. refineries refused to process Soviet oil that was being imported to Cuba, they were expropriated on the heels of land expropriation, um, and that really kind of set in place the beginnings of the economic um, sanctions that, that we talk about today. <laughs> which leads us to the, invade, the uh, 1961 invasion, which I will characterize this way because words are important and depending on who you talk to, um, you, this invasion will be characterized with many different names and each one of those names carries with it um, an ideological point of view. Um, the uh, Museo de la Revolución, the Re Museum of the Revolution in Havana, is I think a must see for any American who goes to Cuba. Um, because you get the Cuban narrative of you know what happened, particularly around the revolution in great detail, um, or, and the and the invasion in great detail, and also the missile crisis afterwards. Suffice it to say, the word missile appears in tiny print in one of the museum panels, and nowhere else. They sort of you have the whole there was this invasion, and it goes into great detail and, and in, in great interest, and then it sort of and then the Americans kind of freaked out. And then it all got better. So it's like, they kind of skipped that part. Um, but what I was, was really astounded at is, is you know, how deeply and incontrovertibly the United States was involved in basically a, a piece of state-sponsored terrorism um, to, to overthrow this government. Um, the invaders got uh, air support from eight um, B-26 bombers, as I recall, six of which were shot down. Nine. Nine. Um, that's a Cuban side of the story. Well, they have the, they have wreckage. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing. You know, some of this stuff you go, well, yeah, show me the, you know, show me the evidence behind the museum. There is, in fact, the wreckage of, of you know, some of these airplanes. Um, uh, the the invasion itself was kind of a, a botched thing. The site was selected um, by the CIA. They believed it was a clear shot into the beach. In fact, there were coral reefs which caused the entire invasion force to run aground where they became sitting ducks for the remaining um, Cuban, uh, remainder of the Cuban Air Force um, that you know, made it difficult for them to establish um, their, uh, their beachheads. And the rhetoric inside the US government was that we would be greeted as liberators. Have you heard that before? Yeah. Um, and in and fact, so what happened is the local militias, as soon as they saw what was happening, and one of the, one of the um, premises of choosing that spot as an invasion site is that there was no good communication back to the capital. So the local militias, by short wave, um, immediately communicated that you know, there was an invasion pending and then the island mobilized, um, which meant that by the time the 1,200 invaders hit the shore, it was just going to be a matter of time um, before they were yep. captured and, and, um, and that invasion and that invasion failed. Um, um, so we decided to go to Playa Huron, which is where the invasion um, took place. Uh, it's, you know, there is a um, lovely museum there. Um, there are actually some informal snaps later on um, of, the, of the museum. We had been, this, um, the trip that I took and, and took with my dad um, was in April, and we uh, turned out to be and we wanted to get out of Havana, uh, just because you know Havana is a lovely old city, and there, there are plenty of pictures of it. Um, but we kind of wanted to get out into the countryside. And while I knew there wasn't going to be a lot to see 
in, uh, in Playa Vidon as a destination, um, I figured the trip there would show us a lot of countryside, as, as in fact it did. Um, Marty was eager to go to the beach, and we had seen that there were pictures of beach there. We did not see this beach. This is what we saw in lieu of beach. It's lovely, and if you snorkel, the coral reefs make it lovely to, uh, to get into the water, but you're not actually going to lie on the beach. Um, Zach is rumored to have found beach I, yeah. further on. From, uh, from where we were. And we know this as the Bay of Pigs, if people are wondering right. what this is. The, yeah, this is a beach on that bay. Right, so this is what you're looking at here is, is um, the Bay of Pigs. Yeah, let me see. And, and there was not any entrepreneurs there. Well, Once the if Americans would take over, there would be a guy selling remnants of the planes and ice cream and popsicles, <laughs> and, but there was nobody, and not even a restaurant there. I mean, well, I mean a lack of a middle class it was demonstrated by this. Uh, I mean, no, no one has built this up as a historical tourist destination, and I think there's potential. Um, but the amount, honestly, the amount of armaments that's, that's in the museum here is, it, it, it tells a truly sobering story. Um, we were there, however, on the day of the crab migration. In fact, our taxi driver said, I'm not sure we're going to make it to the beach because there are so many crabs on the road that they bust the tires on the car. And in fact, we drove down. They, they turn out to migrate mostly in the morning and in the evening. We were there kind of midday. So um, there, but there were about this many squished crabs on the road. I mean, there were literally millions of them. Um, they're ugly little beggars too. We stopped um, at a at a swimming hole. Those of you who know the Yucatan will know that there's this limestone formation that makes for these freshwater um, sinkholes. Uh, that same geographic formation extends to this part of Cuba. Um, and so we actually, you know, having seen a number of these guys flattened on the road, uh, we were walking around the, uh, the little rest area there, and I looked over, and they were clinging to the wall. It was a crab that looked every bit like, like this crab. Um, and, uh, but again, along that whole section of beach, which, you know, could be a lovely place to be, um, there's really there's nothing to do unless you know where to go. We can do questions. Yeah, we can do questions now, or we can do questions at the end, whichever strikes people's fancy. Yeah. Anybody got any questions now? Yeah. Yeah, what? I do. I do. Sure. Uh, so we know the song about Guantanamera. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's Jose Where Martin. Is it? Oh, so, so the, the question is that well, we're familiar with the song Guantanamera, the set music, a poem by Jose Martí set to music. The question is where or what is Guantanamera? It's from. It's in fact about Guantanamo. Someone from Guantanamo is called Guantanamo. A woman from Guantanamo yeah. is a Guantanamo. So a woman from Guantanamo is a Guantanamera, which is yeah, province way out <coughs> west of yeah. Um, yeah, pretty much as far away from Havana as you can get, more or less. Um, so uh, I don't know if Zach wants to talk a little bit about his term at the University of Havana. The pictures here. This, I had to put this one in just to prove that Zach was in fact <laughs> at the University of Havana. Um, those of you who are familiar with Columbia University in New York may remember the statue of alma mater in front of um, the, uh, the library there. Um, her twin is at the University of Havana. Um, and this is that same thing from the steps at the bottom leading to the, uh, um, to the rest of the university. Um, I did want to at least go into one of the classroom buildings so classes were in session, so we just got to walk around the lobby a bit with a large portrait of Simon Bolivar. Um, and so an interesting note about the campus, it was intentionally copied from the Columbia campus, and actually there were three major buildings in Cuba where they did that. The Capitol building is all, also almost an exact replica of our Capitol building, and I can never remember what the third building is. It really bugs me now. Um, but so that was an intentional replica they did. The stonework is all the same, and the statue is supposed to be the same. Um, and the, so obviously I was taking classes there, and one of the things that really surprised me was how similar the classes felt to the classes I take here in the United States. Um, the students, though they're often for very different reasons, the kind of the academic environment felt very much the same. The professors would start giving the same spiel about this class is different than all the others. It's about analysis of these texts, and you really have to show I don't want you to be parroting the, what the authors said. And it was all the same talk of 
um, of things like that, which was very interesting. And all the students were, you know, people taking notes. And though the classrooms were a little bit shabbier, pretty much just old chalkboards, no technology. Um, you know, all the windows open to get the breeze because there was no air conditioning and it was very hot. Do the um, students have computers? Do the students have computers? Um, <coughs> they wouldn't bring them to class, although most students uh, had either some little had access at home to some little tablet or computer because almost all of the um, all of the readings for the class, the first day of class, the professor would come in and hold up a USB drive and say, "Who has a laptop?" And someone would bring up their laptop and they'd plug it in and say, everyone bring up your USB drive and copy all of the readings for the entire semester off of this USB drive. Um, so all of the readings were free and they were all electronic and they just gave them out to all of the students, which was very refreshing after having spent way too much money on all of my books here in the United States. Um, so that was really interesting. So though not all students had laptops, they had all had access to, they could all read them in one, one way or another. Um, on the campus, you can sort of see the, the interior of the campus, the quad with these trees and things like that. Lots of students would, would lounge around between classes. Many coeds? Yeah, I mean, all the classes were good. Yeah, and so and most students, they don't have dormitories because they have a major university in most major cities, so you just go to the university in your city. So the students would go from, would just go home and sleep in their, their homes. Where are you from? Rather, so the, uh, they're asking about the, the racial makeup of the classes was rather mixed, though a slight bias towards whiter, which is how, so my grandfather said um, racism still exists in the country, and that certainly is true, although it is, I would say, much more subtle than in the United States, but there is still just a general bias in both academic institutions and governmental institutions towards lighter skinned people, but it's, it's much, more so, it's never, it never, it doesn't come up in many of the same ways as it does here in the United States, which was interesting. And what courses did you take? What courses? Uh, so I took five courses. Um, one was called Political Economy Two in the uh, Department of Sociology, which was essentially about the construction of socialism in a country. How do you, the theoretical contradictions, the theoretical process of arriving at that, um, what, does, what would it mean for the society? a class called uh, Tendencies in Global Capitalism in the what they call the Department of Philosophy, which we would call political science, which was interesting because it was a, a Cuban, what it really was was a Cuban perspective on uh, kind of current events in modern history from World War II on and the process of the evolution of capitalism in that time from, from their perspective, which was interesting. Uh, I took a Spanish class for, uh, which was through the University of Havana, but specifically for foreigners. I already spoke Spanish when I got there, but I wanted to kind of really um, cement my knowledge. Uh, I also took a Cuban film studies course at a foundation, found, so Gabriel Garcia Marquez founded a cinema foundation in Cuba to help promote pan-Latin American cinema. Um, and so I took a Cuban cinema course there and then one class through my study abroad program, which was sort of an overview course of Cuban history, culture, society, politics, um, religion, and stuff like that, which was also very interesting. So I took five courses. Uh, was, there, was there a baseball uh, season there? So I was there, I got there at the end of the Cuban National League's season, which was lots of fun, because everyone watched all of the games, and then you'd be out just walking around with friends, and people, everyone on the street would be huddled around a little television, everyone watching the go over and watch it with them. Because everyone in Havana, there was a Havana team, so everyone there was rooting for that team. And then after that, they got knocked out, and so then you got to find out who everyone else was rooting for um, up to the finals, which were also very, very exciting. I was also there, the university does have a team, but it's not, college sports aren't, aren't so important there um, because they have this national series. And it's pretty much all baseball. They get all of the European soccer but it's, but that's really just- soccer country? No, the, the youngest generation now is just starting to switch towards soccer, which is interesting and certainly very telling of their changing place in international relations, because Cuba has been so kind of focused on the United States for so long that, you know, of all the Latin American countries, they were the only one that played baseball as their game. They were not a, a, a soccer country, and that's changing a little bit now, which is interesting to watch. Um, so here on the left, again, a little bit of the campus, and on the right uh, was the hostel that I was staying in. It was a grand old building, um, painted bright pink, um, which
which like I said, it's, it was a business hostel for Cubans mostly, run by the Small Farmers Association of Cuba. Um, so a number of other Cubans passed through there in the time that I was there, which was a wonderful opportunity for myself to get to meet them and talk to lots of different people about what their lives were like around the island and, and given the jobs they did. Um, I was the only American to stay there for the whole semester. There were two short programs, uh, one week each, um, different American groups that stayed there also, uh, but I was the only one there for the whole semester. You know, uh, Cuba has gone through a revolution. It's changed its political system, it's changed its economic system with uh, a, a good, some loss of life. But it, it's incredible, as revolutions go, this was not the bloodiest revolution that took place in the world during this time, that's all. We could go on for a long time comparing it to the, the conservative regimes in the southern cone of, of Latin America and loss of life, but we won't go there. Um, what I, where I did want to go was something a bit more fun, which as you see in the foreground of this uh, picture of the University of Havana are two of the, the marquee uh, images of, uh, of Cuba, which are the old cars. One of the effects of the U.S. embargo has been, of course, that um, you know it's been impossible to get new cars until recently. The new cars that are the, the newest cars that are in Cuba, bar a, bar a handful of European imports, are uh, Chinese cars. The medium-aged cars are the um, are the Russian Fiat's. Actually, that oh. black that black one over there is, uh, is the next slide, not the, all the cars. Oh, it might be. Um, yes, it is. Yeah. Look at that. So, Russian Ladas, they're knockoffs of a Fiat. Those of you, who, uh, the, the, those of us who are industrial history geeks, will know that the Russian, the modern Russian automobile industry was basically uh, licensed knockoffs of Fiat technology, and those are the Ladas that uh, that you see. Probably more Ladas on the road in Cuba right now than anywhere else. Um, and um, you know, a testament to uh, Cuban ingenuity, as as often said. Um, and uh, this was a car that, lots of people are gaga over these cars. I am not particularly a car nut, so I am not gaga over these cars. However, the five of us wanted to go on an expedition out to uh, this museum, and the only car we could find that would fit all five of us was this 19, I forget, 57 Mercury. Yeah. And, um, and so uh, John, our, uh, our driver, took us out to one of the farther neighborhoods, and that was kind of fun to be in a convertible and be yeah. driving around in, uh, in, uh, in that kind of uh, in, in that kind of weather. So, you know, I'll say that, you know, that part was uh, was pretty fun. Well, I have a question. Do you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was going to do a quick note about the cars. Yeah, I will talk to you about the uh, these yeah. So, uh, quick note about the cars, if you go back one slide. So we always see these beautifully restored cars in all of the photos and things like that, which they certainly do exist, but are almost solely for the tourists as very expensive taxis. If you go on to the next slide, this car is sort of in the middle, but there are ones that are just completely beat up. You open the door and there's nothing left but the steering wheel, the stick shift, and the seats. And almost invariably, a very fancy radio and speaker system so that the person can listen to his music all day as he drives his taxi around. And the way those function is it's sort of halfway between a bus route and a taxi. So they drive set routes around the city. Um, and if you want to get on, you just hold your hand out and there are some different hand signals you can do to find out what route they're taking so that you, go, you end up going where you want to go. They pull over, you get in, and they'll fill up the car. So there'll be as many as six people in there. And you drive as far down the route as you want to go. And when you want to get out, you just say, hey, show for next corner. And you pay, there's a set price, which was 10 Cuban pesos, which is a little less than 50 cents. And for that, you can drive, as you can go as far around the route as you want to go. Um, and there are, like I said, there are a number of set routes around the city of Havana. Um, so that's how I got around mostly, because it's significantly cheaper than a tourist taxi, and significantly easier than the Cuban bus system. Which, which are much cheaper. Which are much cheaper. They're about, it's, it's half of a Cuban peso per person, which is about two cents, I think we worked out. So it's about two cents to take a Cuban bus, but they are very crowded, They're, the schedule is very erratic, and the um, route is sort of a mystery unless you already know. <laughs> so there's a lot of, does this, does this bus go to that place? Oh, this person says yes, this person says no, this person says goes close, and then you get on and you end up in a different neighborhood where you can walk, so it's okay. So there's lots of uh, experimenting with that. 
So most of the cars are very old, very beat up, but still functional through miracles of, of human ingenuity. Uh, with so few parts, you're amazed they still hold together. So the question, of course, came up is what's going to happen to all these cars? And this is where you begin to get into sort of the mysteries of, of uh, what we heard described as government by whim. Um, so uh, long conversation with the fellow who drove us out to, uh, to um, play you know, to the Bay of Pigs. Um, and I kind of asked him that question. He said, oh, they're going to do the same thing to the cars that they did to the refrigerators. And I said, oh? Um, he said, yeah, when um, we began to, when the government realized that we needed more energy efficient refrigerators and air conditioners, what they did is they told you that your old inefficient Russian refrigerator, you were gonna, they were going to take that